My name is Justin Cottle, and this is The Dissection Room. I'm super excited about today's episode, and that's because I have been obsessed with this topic for years now. Now, obviously, in the past year since ChatGPT came into all of our lives, things have accelerated and become just... They've just been going at a crazy pace, and the, the amount of developments and advancements have been incredible in every single sector. But for me, I have been paying close attention to how AI and biotechnology are going to be impacting healthcare and medicine. And this is such a massive topic. There's just no way I can do this all in one episode. So this is going to become a series of episodes. I originally was planning on doing just a single episode on just like how AI is going to impact healthcare. That would be like a five to six hour podcast episode. And I'm sure there are some of you out there that are like, sign me up, Justin. I would totally do that. But I, I don't think most people are really the type to sit down and listen to that. So instead, I've decided to chunk this out to turn this into just multiple episodes that are a little more manageable. So the topics that we will be discussing in this podcast series are there's going to be quite a few of them, but just to name a few of them. We'll be discussing things like how AI is impacting imaging. This is going to be super, super exciting. We're talking about having an AI uh, analyze CT, MRI, fMRI, PET scans, x-rays, and be able to do things that just even radiologists are not able to do, or at least be able to do them a whole lot quicker. It's absolutely incredible the amount of how this is going to change just diagnoses and just preventative care. And I'm just, I'm so excited. I'm so excited about that. Um, but we'll also be talking about how AI is advancing drug discovery, as well as just various aspects of supplement design. So we're going to be even talking about longevity. I'm really excited about that, which is how much is happening in extending lifespan as well as quality of life and how AI is helping with all of that. But the place I wanted to start first was talking about jobs and how AI is going to be affecting many different types of jobs inside of healthcare, but we're mostly gonna be focusing on just a few jobs. But we're also gonna be talking about some of the different types of AI models that are gonna be used by healthcare providers as well as patients. Basically, the goal of today's episode is to give you an insight as to what is gonna be happening, or at least to my estimation, although I, I will say this, there is going to be some speculation, but I'm trying to limit the speculation as much as possible and instead give you what is currently there, what is already in development, what's been announced. This is not stuff that it's just pure speculation. This is stuff that like Google is saying, oh no, this is actively being red teamed. You know, we have physicians who are experimenting with this type of stuff. So it's, and then you're, we're just going to kind of work or I kind of just build off of that and see what is the, how, where what is the logical extension of that? Where does that go when you start integrating these really robust AI models into actual patient care? So that's what we're going to be kind of focusing on today. And that in order to do that, we have to break down some of these really interesting models that are currently in development and are, again, starting to be red teamed. So they're starting to be placed into different hospital networks. It's really exciting stuff. If you're anything like me, this is going to be an exciting podcast series because you're starting to get an understanding of just how much things are changing and how quickly that's all happening. But again, my goal here is not to feed into the hype. So please, if you're if you're thinking we're going to be like, oh yeah, well, immortality by the end of the decade or just like all of these really pie in the sky type comments, which honestly could be true. Uh, that's still not where you're not going to get that here. Instead, I want to give you and discuss things that are based on data and evidence and, you know, models and things that are already out there. This is stuff that you could sink your teeth into. So with that said, I want to quickly note that we are going to be covering a lot of ground in this episode and in future episodes. And so if you are not really looking to listen to everything that I'm going to be discussing, that is where the description, if you're watching this on YouTube or the show notes, if you're listening elsewhere are going to be very important, kind of give you an idea of where to jump to in that episode to get the information that you're looking for. So don't feel like you need to listen to the whole thing if you're not interested in everything I have to say. So as we start this off, there's one thing I really want to stress and focus right up front, and that is the shortage of physicians in the United States. Now, this is a global issue. You're going to see this same problem in Canada, in the UK, in Europe. You're going to see this literally everywhere. 
I am just familiar or mostly familiar with the data from the United States. So I'm going to be kind of treating everything through that lens, but just understand this is a global issue, but it's obviously an intuitive issue. This is something that has been existing for decades and has just been getting worse. And so what I want to do is actually, I have some data right in front of me. And so I want to kind of just uh, speak this to you and give you an understanding, help paint a picture of exactly the problem we have here. This is all coming from the American Medical Association, and it's estimated that more than 83 million people in the United States currently live in areas without sufficient access to a primary care physician. So your primary care physician, this is that person you go to if you have a problem, and then they can recommend you to specialists from there, or maybe they could treat it for you uh, there in their office. In large parts of Idaho and Mississippi, pregnant women can't find OBGYNs to take care of them. 90% of counties in the United States are without a, a pediatric ophthalmologist. 80% are without an infectious disease specialist. That's 80% of counties in the United States don't have an infectious disease specialist. And more than one third of black Americans live in an area without a cardiologist. So again, this is really at its core about a discrepancy with population as well as just available physicians. As of, I just looked this up yesterday. So as of March 5th, the U.S. population is around 340 million. I, I, you can think to yourself right now, how many physicians do you think are actually in the United States? Because this is something I was thinking about um, prior to actually doing the research. And I was way off on the number. I knew it was a huge discrepancy, but I was still way off. According to January, as of January 2024, there are 1,100,101 physicians in the U.S., and that includes both medical doctors and uh, doctors of osteopathic medicine. So that's both MDs and DOs. One million. So we have 340 million to one million. So you look at the ratio there, and that's obviously a big discrepancy. But there's there's something that you have to understand. Those 1,100,101 physicians don't all practice medicine in the same way, right? They What they're going to do is you're going to have specialists. You're going to... So, for instance, you could have specialists in gastroenterology, you could have ophthalmology, you could have just general care practitioners. So it's not even that they all practice or are capable of doing the same type of medicine or at least to the same kind of quality. So when you look at this, it's not as though like every doctor just needs to be able to see 340 patients per year and then you'd be able to cover it. It's much more distorted than that. And then you also have to think about population centers. There are certain cities and locations in the United States that are going to be more densely populated, and that's going to make things really difficult to see a provider. But again, this is also true outside of the United States, where you have extended wait times to even get in to see a provider. It, you just have this massive discrepancy, and you also have just a discrepancy between the specialties of those available physicians. So again, this problem isn't anything new. This was recognized that it was going to be happening and getting worse decades ago. And so back in the mid-1960s, two positions were created to help supplement physicians. And that is the physician's associate or physician assistant, and then the nurse practitioner, which or so we basically your PAs and your NPs. So you have to understand that your average physician will spend around 11 years or so in schooling, and that doesn't include any kind of specialty training. So from there, it can be another seven years. Like you can have, you can literally be spending 15 to 18, in some crazy cases, all the way up to like 20 years in school to become a specialized physician. Well, if you're an MP or a PA, they're only going to be spending around six to eight years in school. Uh, it kind of just depends on how much healthcare experience they may have prior to that. So for instance, if you are a nurse practitioner, and you were a registered nurse before that, you've also done a lot of your clinical experience. And so that's actually going to accelerate things. There's different types of PA programs that require different amounts of your actual patient care and healthcare experience. So there's nuance to this, but bare minimum, right? We're going from at least 11 to 13 years for a physician for schooling down to six to eight years. And the idea there is less time that there we can actually get more uh, help two physicians. So what you end up having is places like urgent care clinics are going to have 
a physician that will oversee physician assistants and MPs or physician associates. And the idea is that they can do a lot of what a physician can do. Let's be honest. Like I'm not trying to make it seem as though these are underqualified individuals because they are not. These people are definitely qualified for the job that they do, but they aren't as knowledgeable. They aren't as experienced as you will find for a physician. That goes, that is obvious, right? And you can just see this within the pay differences. So for instance, a physician, the mean salary as of May, 2022 is $238,700. That's a, two years ago. Uh, if we were to look at a physician assistant or a physician associate, that same median salary in 2022 is $114,000. For an NP, it's $124,000. Now, you ha so then when you look at the differences in their responsibilities, right? So for their responsibilities, you know, physicians can do a lot of different things, including oversee the PAs and the MPs, intake, treatment protocols, paperwork, um, even performing treat like surgical treatments, right? Like you, there's so many things a physician can do and PAs and MPs can do a lot of those things. It's just less of them. So for instance, physicians are able to do a whole wide variety of surgical treatments, even if they're not a surgeon, but obviously they can do more if they are a surgeon, but again, that's a specialization. Well, a PA on the other hand can also do some types of technically surgery things like say like remove like an ingrown toenail. They can do suturing, right? There's certain things they can do, but they're not meant to be able to do everything a physician can because if they were, then they would have to become a physician. And this idea here is when you look at this, remember there was 1,100,000 physicians. Well, there are 385,000 NPs as of 2022. And then there are 140,000 PAs as of 2022. So when you start putting this together, the total amount of healthcare providers is around 1.6 to 1.7 million in the United States to that 340 million. So this is a huge discrepancy in patient care, right? The available healthcare providers for these patients. And again, this has been known to be a problem. Like this is, people have known this for decades but it's only getting worse as we can all see as extended wait times, the availability. Oh, you need to see, <laughs> you need to see a rheumatologist. Well, that'll be two months from now. All of this has been known, but it's only starting to get worse. Now, if we move just beyond the numbers, let's start actually thinking about the stresses of the job for these healthcare providers, because they have high patient loads. But the other thing that they have to deal with is things like pandemic. For example, right, the sheer amount of exhaustion and stress that it was placed on healthcare providers during the pandemic is also helping to feed the crisis that we are currently in. But here's another interesting data point that I don't think a lot of people are understanding of, and that is that physicians today spend about two hours on paperwork for every one hour they spend with a patient. That's, an, that's incredible, right? That's just way too much. It's so much paperwork, that you, right? Taking those notes, putting everything into the system. Like there's so much that goes into it. And yet you're still supposed to see all these different types of patients, right? We all recognize there is a problem when it comes to just how impersonal these visits feel. Right? This is this is a known thing. This is a known thing within healthcare as well. If you talk with healthcare providers, most of them will say, I, I am so bothered by how little time I am able to spend with my patients. But unfortunately, it's just part of the system. When you have so many people looking to get in, there's only so much time you can spend with them. And it's not just because you're looking to get the next patient in, it's because you have paperwork, you have other things that you have to do. And so this is an enormous problem. But there's another thing on top of this that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. And that comes down to keeping up to date with <laughs> the world and advancements being made within health and medicine. So I, this is, this is going to blow your mind. Every 26 seconds, a new paper is published in the medical literature. That if you, if you do the math, that's over 3000 papers that are published. This is globally that are published every single day, every single day, three over 3000 papers. So this is, these are, these are papers that are you know, investigations, research being investigated into advancing medicine and healthcare protocols and treatments and everything that goes with it, there is no way that physicians 
can keep up with this. It's just not possible. Again, you go back to their how stressed they already are and stretched thin they already are to now expect them to <laughs> read this. It's just not practical, which is why there is what we call up to date. So up to date is it used to be a CD-ROM that then became a website and it's now more properly defined, I think, as an app. But up to date is a reference tool for healthcare providers. Um, and so basically you'd almost think of it like Wikipedia. And this is, when I say that, people are like, oh boy, oh, this isn't good. But I want you to think about how important this actually is. So what you have is a network of physicians worldwide that are perusing that published literature. Those 3,000 articles that are published every single day, they are doing their best to peruse it, to look through it, and see if some update needs to be made in treatment protocols for physicians to be able to look at. So what they'll do is they will go and update up to date, this uptodate.com, this app. And then what'll happen is physicians and healthcare providers worldwide um, actually have access to this on their phones. They have access to this, you know, in, in their working environment. And then they can reference this and look to see, hey, what is the standard treatment? What do we really know about this? Because sometimes it's even just patient education. Maybe there's no change that's going to be made in any kind of treatment as much as you just want to make sure you're giving the patient the most up-to-date information about what's going on with their condition. So what will happen is these physicians using their clinical expertise and their experience over decades will go in, say, yes, this paper has enough value to update things, or maybe it doesn't. But I want you to think for a moment about how challenging of a task that is. There's just no way they can do it. And even the ones, the papers that they're reading, they can't do some kind of robust meta-analysis where they are comparing this data from this from this article to this article to this article. There's just no physical way to accurately do that, which means that the medicine, that, that the treatment protocols and everything we know about medicine is inherently wrong. Some of it is going to be more wrong than other aspects. Some of it may be barely wrong to the point it's insignificant. Others might be far more inaccurate. But this is the problem, right? This is not from a lack of trying. This is not from a lack of caring or empathy. This is just saying, it's difficult. How do you overcome this problem? It's borderline impossible. And so what you then are relying on is the experience of clinicians and healthcare providers all over the world to just make the best judgment call. And so they're operating again within networks, different protocols within the hospitals and the clinics and all these different things. Everyone is just doing the best they can. But as it stands today, we know for a fact that treatment is not where it needs to be from the, from the sense that it's the, the information is not as up-to-date as it needs to be, even on something called up-to-date. And it never can be given the current methods. And then you have just an overextension of healthcare providers all throughout the country. And this is where AI comes into the picture. So to really properly understand the power of the different AI models, I do want to set a little bit of the background up as to what these AI systems and models are. Back in 2015, a Google, Google published a paper called Attention is All You Need. And this paper, I really cannot overstate how influential and important this paper was. It literally revolutionized and changed everything about AI as we knew it and just set the stage for what is happening right now. Without getting overly technical, because for one, I'm not a computer scientist, but two, I also don't think it's important for ex us exactly here. This just made it so you can put in large amounts of data and pay attention to certain aspects of it more so than others, and you end up getting a better output. So beforehand, if you didn't have these attention mechanisms, you try to feed like a book to the AI models it would have to read in sequence every single word. So it's like it's it's like it's reading the book like you would read the book. And what would happen is the AI model would start to forget what it was actually what actually came before it and things start to deteriorate. It just was a mess. And so we found that you couldn't actually train AI models on large amounts of data. But this paper showed that there is a technique that makes it so you can. And what you end up with so far right now, what, what a lot of people are excited about are large language models, but there's many different types of models that can use this attention mechanism. But to give you an idea of what is so, people are, I think, 
missing the point with chat GPT and they're either expecting too much of it or they expect too little of it. So to give you an understanding of what chat GPT is, chat GPT is a large language model. It is a chat interface with a different type of system called GPT-4 or GPT, I think it might even be 4.5 at this point. The point here is when you are talking with chat GPT, you are talking with human knowledge. They took essentially every bit of data they could possibly find on the internet and trained it with a massive amount of, of compute. And then what you end up with are all of the attention mechanisms, essentially, all the things that got transformed. And then you can talk with it and ask it questions and it can give you an answer based on everything that's read. So a lot of, so I just want you to understand, it's not like chat GPT is just this predicting the next word that's going to come out. Yes, that is there to an extent, but what you're really doing is you are communicating with every aspect of human knowledge. That is useful in a lot of ways, and it's also not very useful in other ways. So when people will say like, I've seen this question a lot, will chat GPT replace doctors? The immediate answer right now is no, but that's because that's also not open AI who produce chat GPT. That's not their goal. They're not looking to do that. I mean, they're, they have different goals. Their goal is to create what's called artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence. They're not looking to replace doctors specifically. So ChatGPT is not going to do that. But even still, ChatGPT is also not the right large language model to even do that. Because since it's been trained on everything, I want you to think, what, what means everything? Um, this is where you're trained on Reddit. Likely you're trained on Twitter, you're trained on Facebook, you're trained on all these available public sources of data that are no longer public. But the point here is you're trained on all this data. You, it's, it's, it's like, if you're asking a medical question to someone, you don't want to ask it to Facebook. You don't want to ask it to Reddit and get an answer and trust that maybe it's right. Maybe it's not. So that's the thing. Don't be looking to chat GPT for medical type of AIs. It's just not that, that's just not what we really want to be looking at. Instead, what you want to be looking at are a few AI models coming out of Google. I am not, I would not be surprised if there are other companies that are trying to do this. It's just the ones that I'm familiar with and the ones that I've been able to research properly are all coming from Google. And I think that actually is important because Google also has easy access to the published literature, just be, I mean, just think of like Google Scholar, for instance. For those who are not familiar, Google Scholar is an interface to research and look for and search throughout the available published literature. So Google is just the perfect fit for this. So there are a few different models that Google is producing that are trying to be specific for healthcare. Instead of being trained on the immensity of the internet, it's like, we're, no, we're going to focus on very specific training data sets to give a very specific outcome. And the idea, just to kind of spoil this, is to help healthcare providers, to help bridge this gap, to create collaborators, to help them in some really unique and powerful ways. So the first one is one called MedPalm2. MedPalm2 stands for medical pre-trained language model. And this thing is absolutely incredible. This is a large language model that was been has been trained on a whole lot of data. So I'm going to get a little bit technical here for a second. Just stick with me. It's trained on medical exams. So think like the United States medical licensing exam. It's trained on medical research. Remember, the 3,000 or so medical papers that are published every single day, this large language model is trained specifically on those. Obviously up to a point. You, you can't constantly update it. So there is obviously an issue with that, but still. And then it's also trained on consumer medical questions. It has all these different topic data sets from all over the place, including from PubMed. It is then finely tuned or fine-tuned and reinforced by human physicians. But on top of that, you also then have Google's own unique um, training data set called Health Search QA. 
and this is 3,173 commonly searched consumer questions. My point here is, with all of this specific medical data, right, we're talking not just the medical research, but also, like, you can almost think of it like um, uh, consultation data, right? How does a doctor and a physician even communicate with a patient? We're talking about how do you even navigate the the problem set as a physician of figuring out a diagnosis? There's a lot of unique things that, to no surprise, healthcare providers are trained on at for years and years at school. Basically, it's taking all of that and training the large language model on it. And Here's the thing that is absolutely crazy. Last year, I think this was published in about July of last year in 2023, the MedPalm 2 achieved an 86.5% on a test of United States medical licensing exam style questions. Now, to be clear here, it didn't get an 86.5% on the USMLE. The USMLE is a three-step test, and it's not as simple as just like you get a passing percentage. The first step is pass or fail, but the next two steps are not. There's just a little more complexity to it. The point I'm making here is it passed with an 86.5% on questions that if you gave that to a physician, most of them would probably not get 86.5% on this same test, even ones that have passed the United States Medical Licensing Exam. Now, it's important to understand though, just because you can pass a test doesn't necessarily make you a good physician. One of my favorite um, jokes, it's not a good joke, but it is, um, what do you, what do you call someone who passes the United States medical licensing exam with an A? Doctor. What do you call someone who passes the United States medical licensing exam with a C? Doctor. To be a good doctor, to be a good physician, to be a good healthcare provider, it requires more than just being able to pass a test. You have to be able to interact with a patient through empathy, understanding. There's so many things that go into this, including how you even ask them questions. This is not a simple thing to just sit there because no one wants that machine-like interaction with a physician where they just blitzkrieg you with a bunch of questions and it feels like it's a robot. And sure, you get to the bottom line, but it's like, wow, I just felt like I walked through an assembly line. And I guarantee you've probably had that experience with a physician which is, in my estimation, a bad, not a bad physician, I don't want to go that far, but that's a bad experience. And you are justified in being upset about that. So you don't want to just put an over-reliance on the passing of this test. That is not everything there. So the next thing that Google has created is what's called MedLM. This stands for Medical Language Model. And this is partially powered by MedPalm 2, the one we just discussed. But this one is built specifically for healthcare providers. So think about it like this. You have MedPalm 2 that has been trained on this immense amount of data, medical data. And then you now create a language model that healthcare providers can directly communicate with. So it's not going to be overly technical. It's going to it's actually built to communicate specifically with them. So I'm going to read a couple things here. MedLM has been tuned for specific medical tasks such as select forms of summarization and medical question answering. So what that means is, say like when a physician has their notes that they've taken from an actual visit and a consultation with a patient, they could put those notes into MedLM and it would summarize it in a very natural way that can then be helpful in producing a diagnosis. Absolutely amazing. But it's also been fine-tuned for medical question answering. And I'll get to that more in a second. It says here, it is intended to be used for question answering and creating draft summaries from existing documentation. Again, kind of already discussed that. But here's the part that really interests me. MedLM is also used for educational purposes for a healthcare professional to engage in medical questioning and answering to help support that professional. So think about it like this. In the same way you have up to date where the physicians and nurses, anyone inside of the healthcare landscape can have access to help to up to date. They can refer to it. Now you can refer to this large language model called MedLM that is powered by MedPalm 2 that has been completely updated. Maybe not completely, but largely updated with the massive amount of medical research. You can now start questioning it. 
but it, you question it like a provider would, right? In this, if I gave you med LM, you probably wouldn't know the best questions to ask it to get the best possible results, but a physician would. They can ask the right questions based on how it's been fine-tuned to actually interact with the, that massive training set to get the best possible results. Absolutely mind-blowing. But it doesn't stop there. Now, Google has also created what is called AMI. AMI, A-M-I-E, stands for Articulate Medical Intelligence Explorer. This is built for patients. It's more like patients and providers, but it's more specific to patients. So I'll give you an idea of what this is. It's a research AI system based on a large language model that is optimized for diagnostic reasoning and conversations. That's wordy. What that means is just like ChatGPT is meant to interface with you and you can ask it in your own little, you know, non-technical ways, questions, and you can get answers back. Amy is basically like you're talking to a physician. Amy is a large language model that I, it doesn't say that it's actually built on MedPalm 2. Um, it just, so it may or may not be. I, I don't actually understand or know that myself. But this is meant to actually be a chat bot that is like a doctor. And I know a lot of people are immediately turned off by that. They're like, oh, roll your eyes. Like, I don't need this. I want a human. I get it. I get where you're coming from. But this is where we go back to, okay, well, if this has passed the United States medical licensing exam with 86.5%, again, that doesn't necessarily make it a good physician, a good healthcare provider. What's missing is the empathy. What's missing is the diagnostic consultation skills. That's what they train Amy on. It says here, we trained and evaluated Amy along many dimensions that reflect quality in real world clinical consultations from the perspective of both the clinicians and patients. So basically when building this, they studied many different consultations in the real world and also then used actors and physicians and started to try and mimic how a normal conversation happens inside of that clinical setting. And this is designed for it to be more empathetic, to be more understanding, to feel less like a chat bot. Is this perfect? No. Is this the ideal situation? No, you always want a human. But like we already talked about, we have an immense shortage of healthcare providers. So what are we supposed to do? This is what, so what I want you to do is start thinking about putting all of this together, where you now have an interface between Amy at MedLM and MedPalm2. Doctors now have access through artificial intelligence to the propensity of medical knowledge. Patients now have access to an, an empathetic doctor and physician of sorts through Amy that can then give every a bit of the information. So let's say you're talking with Amy and whatever you tell it gets packaged and then delivered to an actual human healthcare provider. That healthcare provider can then work with that knowledge to help further and better their diagnosis. It could just be a preliminary thing where they look at this, get an understanding of who you are, you then come in and meet with them and they already have a, a better understanding of what's going on than they would have if they just came in and you started interacting just you know, from the ground up. Now, if you're anything like me, this relationship between the physician and this data has a similar feel to the relationship a physician has with a physician associate, the PA, and the nurse practitioner, the NP. So if you remember from earlier, let's say you work in an urgent, so let's, let's look at an urgent care clinic. You may have a physician or two physicians on staff, and then you have multiple physician associates, physician associates or NPs, or maybe some mixture of both. It really just depends on the individual needs of the clinic. And they're the ones who are meeting with patients the physician themselves might meet with the patient, but then that physician is overseeing them. And then what can happen is if the PA and MP need some help, they can talk with the physician. They can get their, you know, a recommendation based on their expertise for the diagnosis. They can work together as a team, right? The, this is the whole purpose of the PA and NP positions is to just help make it easier on physicians and patients and just have a team effort for help for patient care. There's a very similar feel to it. 
with this. But now it's like you're now adding that to the physician assistants, <laughs> to the PAs and the MPs. But I think like if you logically start thinking through this, there is risk for job loss. And people talk about like, okay, is this going to replace a physician? I don't see that happening anytime soon, but I do see that happening. I think that's an inevitability. But I think we also need to understand that that's everywhere with everything. Every job is potentially on the chopping block at some point, given the advancements of technology. We can have discussions around how quickly that's going to happen for some. Here's the thing. You don't want to rush this too quick. This is because imagine if you put out a bunch of, you know, artificial intelligence models, we rush it out. We're just having them treat patients like crazy. We start laying off physicians and then the things just don't go well. That's not a good place to be in, especially because you're going to cripple all the up and coming physicians. Because the thing you have to understand, if I was going through medical school or if I was going through a PA or an MP program right now in 2024, I would be looking at this with a very close eye. Wondering, what is my career going to look like in a few years? Because while I don't expect this to replace doctors in the next five years, I think it's a more realistic conversation within to, to actually replace physicians within the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. Again, this is where we are getting into speculation. However, I do think it's a different story when it comes to PAs and MPs. Because I want you to think about the ethics of this too as these models are only going to continue getting better. You have to understand that right now, this is the worst it's ever going to be again, right? It's never going to be this bad. It's only going to get better. So if we're already passing with an 86.5%, what happens on the USMLE? What happens when this starts passing with a 99%, 100% efficiency? What happens when empathy scores go through the roof? What happens when you're able to deploy this and we start seeing significant changes in patient care outcomes, we're talking di triage, diagnosing people ahead of time. When you start actually seeing how powerful this can be, all of a sudden you have this ethical implication where you start wondering, well, okay, if we're paying $115,000 to a PA, if we're paying $124,000 to an MP, is that really worth it? If what we could do instead is have all of these artificial intelligences, right, and their products actually reporting to a physician in the same sense. This to me seems like the first step. Before you would replace a doctor, you would replace the NP and the PA. And, and honestly, there's probably going to be other support staff that are going to be replaced as well, but also not so much others because there's physical things that need to happen. And this is where we're getting a little more into the nuances of it, right? In, it's, it's, it's strange to think about this, but in my head, it's almost as though the MAs, the medical assistants and the RNs, the registered nurses, they might have more job security than the PA and the MP do, despite those being clearly more qualified, simply because they are doing something more grounded, right? They're taking vitals there, which again, by the way, PA and MPs do as well. It's, this is where you're getting into the complexity of this. And it's not, I don't mean to try and Make it as though like simplify these jobs and these positions to just certain things. There is a lot of things that these people do. My point is simply AI is going to replace a lot of that. And there is an ethical implication and just obligation to work with this. You also have to think from an insurance perspective. If this is starting to actually benefit insurance companies because they're able to track things beforehand and you're actually getting better preventative care, they're not having to shell out a lot of money for a lot of diagnostics and just treatment methods, that is also going to be a further motivation to get AI integrated more robustly into the healthcare system. You also have to think globally and worldwide. You know, maybe your average United States citizen doesn't really want to interact with Amy, that chat bot as much, but if you're in Uganda or if you're somewhere, say like in some third world country, that could be all you have. That could be huge and that could really help and make drastic improvements and changes to their healthcare systems. And so then you have to start looking at this from the first world. If you start seeing huge shifts happening there and we're more hesitant on our side, but we're still, we're seeing the huge improvements that may just start creating that imperative to start switching it into our systems. My point here is I believe 
in the next five years, we're going to start seeing a massive shift in how patients are interacting with healthcare providers. And it's going to start being a lot through these artificial intelligences because Amy could be on your phone. This is where things get really interesting is when you start thinking about, okay, well, what's when we start integrating health information from say like a smartwatch, right? I have an Apple watch in front of me. You have garments, you have all these different smart apps and smart tech that is monitoring a lot of things like heart rate, blood oxygen levels, so many different amazing things. Now imagine Siri or Alexa or all of these different types of, you know, AIs that we already interact with are now fueled and supercharged like Amy. And then it's almost like you walk into a clinic and your AI that exists for you can now interact and give a bunch of vital information, all sorts of really great, robust medical information to the AI of the, of the clinic, of the, the emergency room, of your family care doctor. Do you see how this is really going to start changing? And I see this starting to change within the next five years because this is what we're talking about as human health. And there are small changes that will act as proving grounds because if, so again, it's not hard to have an AI on your phone, or at least it won't be within the next five years that is extremely capable and is going to be able to take this information and really do some interesting stuff with it. And again, we're going to talk more about that in future episodes. I want you to know, this is the tip of the iceberg here, because again, when we're getting to just what AI can do through like imaging and just at data analysis alone. Let me give you a, a small hint of it. Um, AI has been able to detect kidney disease by looking at the back of the retina. So the retina is the photoreceptive layer in your eye. An ophthalmologist who has looked at thousands upon thousands upon thousands of retinas is not going to be able to detect kidney disease or know where to begin with that, but an AI could. And this and these types of things are going to start just coming through the woodwork. We're going to start finding them all over the place. And so when we start making all these small changes and start seeing the improvements, again, I'm not saying that the PA and MP and all these jobs are going to go away right away. It's just that I think it is inevitable that those are going to start going away. And what instead is going to happen is we're going to have a collaborator with physicians. And this collaborator with the physicians, with the RNs, with the, with the MAs, with all the support and administrative staff within the hospitals and clinics and everywhere else, when you start integrating that with personal AI, I think we're going to just have, and this is all starting to happen within the next five years, but look at it from a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year out, uh, outlook. This is going to just, this is going to revolutionize absolutely everything. This is what I'm so excited about. This is where I look at AI I and I just get so enthusiastic. I just want to talk about it to everybody. And this to me is a real easy way to do that is to say, look, we can save lives. We can improve lives. And this is not even talking about longevity and just life extension and everything that's going to be coming with that. So if you find this interesting, just buckle up, buckle up because this is where, this is only the tip of the iceberg. But at the same time, I think it's important that we also discuss some of the potential problems because at the end of the day, we have to figure out liability purposes. Who do we blame if one of these models is wrong? We know who to blame if it's a doctor. We have, we can sue them for malpractice. There's all sorts of questions. Like, do, 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 do you sue Google? <laughs> do you sue Apple? Can you sue anyone? Um, we start to ask, you know, well, what do you do with all these displaced jobs? If you have someone who went to PA school and went 300 plus thousand dollars in debt, what are you going to do with them now? Did an RN? Did you just have them replace an RN? What do you do with radiology techs? What do you do with like this? Is this is where things are going to get difficult? And this is what I think a lot of people just have to start settling. We have to figure this out. There's so many questions that come with this, but the problem that I don't even want to say it's a problem. The thing that everyone just needs to understand is that this is coming, and this is important because at the end of the day, it comes down to saving lives or saving jobs. Saving lives is going to trump that every time. And I think that's the right call. But that doesn't mean that the jobs are not valuable and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something about it. But for me, if I was looking for a career inside of medicine right now, I would be keeping a very close eye on this and asking myself, is going to medical school the right option for me? Is going to PA and MP school 
is that the right option? Maybe if I'm really dedicated and I want to be treating patients, maybe I want to just, maybe I want to go the registered nurse route because you can always then graduate to an NP in the event that that stays around. These are all questions that you just want to be asking yourself. And for those who are already in these positions, they need to be understanding of what is coming to. And again, given how stressed and busy they are, it's understandable that they're not really aware of a lot of this, but they need to be. So there is a lot to say here. There's a lot coming down the pipeline, but my hope is that uh, you have some basic understanding of how AI is starting to integrate itself into our healthcare system in the United States and how that is starting to affect some jobs. So again, I fully plan on doing many different episodes along this theme of just how is it going to affect different aspects of healthcare and medicine. So if you enjoyed this, please be sure to give it a like, give it a listen, share it, do whatever you got to do to help support the channel, the podcast and everything we're doing. Um, I'm so excited to be here and doing this. This is, this to me is so much fun. I'm just downstairs in my basement, in my little home studio that is very, very modest And I'm just having the time of my life, getting to talk about some really cool stuff. And my hope is that you're interested in that just as much as I am. But again, I just wanted to say thank you and um, I'll see you in the next episode.